pleased to be here this morning, although creative mornings are not really my thing, being an evening person, so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. It's kind of a pushing me outside the box. It's a crossover. I'm doing from evenings to mornings. And because Radio K still has <clears throat> a very soft spot in my heart, so the University of Minnesota, obviously, uh, one of the reasons why I came here to the Twin Cities, my partner at the time wanted to study here. We knew about the walker and we knew about the replacements. <clears throat> so I thought, Twin C seriously, I saw if the replacements come from there, that's all I knew. And that you had the Mississippi, because I had to spell that when I was a kid over and over again. Um, so yeah, I came in 92 and uh, worked for a long time on Radio K and thought that was my dream job because I got to work with students every day and do radio. But that's because I couldn't have dreamed up the current 12 years ago. But don't let me get ahead of myself. I'm going to do uh, 20 minutes, they asked me to do, and talk about the crossovers that I've experienced in my life. Uh, I love the theme, and uh, it's really relevant right now, I think. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples, and then hopefully we'll do a Q&A, which I'm really excited about. So crossing over, <clears throat> some of you might know that by the accent, I'm not from here originally. Some of you might think I'm Australian, which is what a majority of people used to think. I'm actually from a really tiny town or a tiny village called Clenchwharton near Kings Lynn, which is close to Cambridge in the UK. And I grew up there and went to school in uh, Leeds uh, for university and trained eventually to be a teacher. That's what I was dreaming to be because I thought teaching was a very honorable profession and uh, someone suggested I could do it and I was like, are you serious? I can be a teacher? So I was kind of an average student and they, you know, I didn't have any other aspirations so they said, yeah, you can be a teacher. <laughs> that didn't sound good, did it? <laughs> so, uh, I was in college uh, studying how to be a teacher, and this opportunity came up to come to the United States. We used to have an organization called British University North American Camp Counselors, BUNAC. And they would employ you to come and work at a camp in the United States, and then basically give you six weeks to travel around the States before you had to get back to school in England. So for us, it was a perfect way to get over here. And I don't know if you remember these days, but for us, culturally, everything came from America that was new, that was exciting. Kojak, you know? When I was a kid, I'd watch Kojak and see the steam coming out of the grates in New York City and go, really? So that was my experience of New York, and uh, when I traveled there and saw it actually happen, I was like, no. I actually had a, a manhole cover blow up right in front of a taxi I was in in New York. In my first, that was my first New York experience. It just went boom, right up in the air and dropped back down again. Like, this place is nuts. <laughs> so that was kind of a crossover for me, just culturally. Uh, coming here and experiencing a new culture. But I loved it every time I came. I didn't hold Saturday Night Fever against you guys anymore. Because I did. When we were punks, 76, 77, we were punks, we were anarchy in the UK, we were, I'm so bored in the U, with the USA because of Saturday Night, of, uh, <laughs> Saturday Night Dancing? No, what, what was it? Saturday Night Fever, there you go. See, I blotted it out of my mind completely because it was so, so horrible. 
we hated you guys for that as punks. So I got over that really quickly though when I came here and saw how many cool people they were and they weren't all dancing with the thing, so. Um, but let's focus on waffling because it's early in the morning. So the first crossover I think is important to me is just crossing over between England and America. And I would seriously advise anyone at some point in their life, and it's a good point when you're kind of a graduate, graduating from college, to travel. For me, a big crossover is traveling. It forces us as human beings to look at ourselves differently because other people start to look at us differently. Um, I can't really exaggerate this too much, but there is no way it's beyond a dream, beyond a fantasy, that I would ever be a DJ in the UK, employed as a DJ. Back in the 70s, there were four radio stations in the UK. Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3, Radio the BBC. And only one of them played the music that I liked, which was Radio 1. And only for two hours a night when John Peel was on was the music I really liked, and he uh, stayed in that job until 10 years ago when he died. So there was no way that there was a job for me in the UK, and I didn't go to the right schools. This is a perfect example. I didn't go to Cambridge or Oxford, and back in the day, you had to go to one of those schools to be employed by the BBC. There were no college stations, there were no community stations. I had no access to, to be on the radio at all. And so when I came to America and, <laughs> get this, the summer camp that I was a counselor at had a radio station. You could only hear it like two miles from the camp, but it had a radio station. And I got to play with the kids. I got to be a DJ. And that started to think, whoa, really? And then I traveled that first summer and I ended up in St. Louis with some friends and they worked for the community TV station, which had a radio station too. And I'm like, wait, wait, you guys get to make TV and radio as volunteers? And they're like, yeah, yeah. That was completely new to me. So again, that crossover of just thinking of myself as capable or even having the possibility to be on the air, on TV, on radio, because I'd moved to another country. And lo and behold, people think my accent's cool here. <laughs> I'm like, no one thought that in the UK. And so I got the liberty, I, <clears throat> literally the liberty to do radio because my voice sounds a little bit different and people are not sure where it comes from and maybe that's better for my career. So right there, <clears throat> huge crossover and totally changed my life. Totally changed my life. I volunteered uh, to do radio for nearly 12 years before I ever got paid for it. <clears throat> and I waited tables for those 12 years, which again, I couldn't do in the UK because they don't tip in the UK. So it's a bad job to have in the UK. But over here, it was a great job. I basically paid my way through waiting tables while I volunteered to do radio. So perfect crossover, do it if you can. Especially, I have to say for you guys, you're not close. You know, the Brits kind of, you know, now they go to Paris for the day, which was crazy in my mind when I was a kid, but they travel to Europe and they have to go through that process of crossing over. Um, for you guys, it's harder because you're further away from other cultures who approach life differently, but try and do it. So that's my big crossover. That's the, that's the crossover that's had the most impact on my life. <clears throat> and I'm very proud to say that I became an American citizen two years ago because I literally realized it's kind of unseemly for you not to be a citizen, Mark, because literally, like I've just told you, your life was changed by coming to the States. You would never be in the situation that you are now, blessed by being recognized as a radio personality in the UK. So what's your problem? Do the citizen thing. And I did, and I'm really proud I did. And I hope 
seriously to spend the rest of my life. If not in Minnesota, and I really hope it's Minnesota because I love this place too, but uh, I think of myself now as a citizen of America, which is a huge crossover for me. Again, if you'd have asked my 16-year-old self, are you gonna be a citizen? I'm, there's no way. So, um, big crossover. So then let's pick up the career thing because the other crossover is that um, I started, as I said, volunteering to do radio in a community radio station that was actually in New Jersey called WFMU. That's where I learned how to push the buttons. And that's a very unique station. You should check it out, but there's not one like it anywhere else on the planet. So I didn't realize how lucky I was to be there, um, but that's where I learned how to push the buttons. And they had a very specific mindset of how to approach radio programming, um, very eclectic. Uh, very avant-garde, very out there, very weird, very wacky. Not anywhere near commercial. They, they don't even take money from underwriters. They're totally listener-supported. That's their deal. So they're, they're like the extreme of listener support. And then when I came here, I went straight to KFAI because I knew of them as a station, and they were the easiest station to get involved in, and I volunteered again, taking out the trash, and all in uh, equipment until they gave me the local. <laughs> and how crazy is that? We, we were changing the schedule in 93, and uh, I happened to be on the committee that was working to figure out what we should do. And they said, well, we've got to have a local music show, and hands up those who want to do a local music show. And I'm like, <laughs> I was the only one, literally. It was by default. They're like, no one else wants to do that. <laughs> the Brit gets to do the local show. so. Uh, that was kind of crazy. And it was just because I was so excited about being here because you have no idea. You've got so many venues. It was almost like this is a great kind of, because everyone who was involved at KFAI at the time pretty much had grown up here. And the Minnesotans were kind of like, yeah, right, the local music scene. You know, that they didn't see it in my eyes. They didn't see how many venues the, the cities have. They didn't see the styles, uh, the amount of genres that were being made. They didn't appreciate what they had in their community as much as I did because I'd come from outside and gone, wow, you guys are blowing my mind. I was out three or four nights a week seeing bands and that's what I was into at the time. So they fed off that enthusiasm. So I did the community radio thing for five years before Zone 105, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> It went Rev 105, Zone 105, Drive 105, Love 105. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they employed me for 18 months to do, as Carl said, uh, an import show. Because you've got that crazy accent, Mark. So in commercial radio, you know, I went and said, let me be a radio DJ. And they're like, no, no, you can't do it like a regular shift because you've got that wacky accent. So you got to do something wacky. So do an import show. So I kind of roll my eyes. Even though for the seven years previously, I'd been doing a local music show. No, you don't do local music. You do the import show because of the wacky accent. So that was kind of my first introduction to commercial radio, and I ended up doing overnights for them as well. So I kind of stepped into the commercial radio world. And then in 1998, the Radio K job came up, and I grabbed it and thought, this is my dream job. And seriously, back then, I would have seen myself still being there and still being proud to be part of a radio station and part of the school, the U of M. And I had seven wonderful years there and literally thought it was my dream job because I wanted to be a teacher. I was kind of a teacher. I actually told my mom I was a professor of radio at the U of M. <laughs> She thought that was wonderful. She told people that, and I, for years I got by, Mom, I'm a professor at the U of M, you know. <clears throat> she literally was worried when I took the job at The Current. She's like, are you sure? Because you won't be a professor at the U of M anymore. <laughs> wow. But she kind of had a point, because back then we didn't know if The Current would work. And I know you're like, what? Ten years ago, Minnesota Public Radio did 
an amazing thing. And that's not just because I've drunk the Kool-Aid and I'm employed by them, but because I know how the industry works. And this is the other crossover thing. What they've actually done is they've crossed over. They've made a hybrid of a radio station that comes organically from the community. So it grew out of the community, literally by employing us as the DJs, because Mary, Bill, myself, had all David Campbell had all done local music shows for years on other radio stations, and they brought us all together. So they built something that grew out of community, so it really is community radio and organic, and that's why I think, that's one of the reasons why I think we've survived and thrived. But they did it with a kind of hybrid, working with commercial, not as a commercial, we can't, because of the rules, we can't be a commercial radio station, but they approached the community and the underwriters and the foundations and the philanthropists as if they were a commercial station. That balance, that keeping that balance and walking that fine line is a really, really tough thing to do. Sometimes I think we fall off it. Some people, for example, don't like the idea that we created Shell's beer, you know, because, whoa, community, public radio, you got your own beer? That's a little commercial, isn't it? But it's that kind of working with the community and figuring out how can we form a hybrid station which has never existed before. And again, you know, without going back into a lot of industry stuff, I hope you can appreciate how special this, this thing is. Because A, Minnesota Public Radio are the only state public radio organization in the country that could have created the current. That's because of our resources. We now have more members than New York City Public Radio. We have more, more listeners just because of the network of stations we have in Minnesota. We own stations in South California and in South Florida. We're the biggest public radio corporation in the country. So then financially and just resource-wise, we're the only ones that could have pulled off the current. Literally, they needed $10 million just to buy the transmitter before you start. So you need those resources. And as a public radio entity, you know, the, the peers, the people across the country were like, are you guys nuts? What are you doing? They weren't gonna do news, which is public radio, you know, for 50 years it's been news. They weren't gonna do classical because they already had a classical and a news station. So what were they gonna do? They're gonna create something new. Inside the industry, they called it a third service because they knew that public radio had to create something that was going to appeal to a younger audience. Because apparently, no one over the age of 30 cares what's happening, or under 30 cares what's happening in the world, so they don't listen to news radio. That's what the industry says. And nobody over, under the age of 55 knows what's going on on classical radio. Seriously, because they don't get taught it anymore in schools. So public radio had to create a new hybrid for its future to survive. So it kind of had to cross over. Mentally, internally, mentally cross over from how do we approach this as a public radio station. And externally project itself, because we know all of the creative mornings, everything is about branding. Everything's about how do you appear to your community and your audience. And so we've had to do a lot of crossover there, and we're still learning. Where is that line where our audience is not going to be, even in the way we sound? You know, we sound just production values wise, and the way we structure our day in our program, we sound more like a commercial radio station than a typical public radio station. And again, you can go anywhere in the country and not find one that sounds quite like us with as big an audience. You know, there are uh, cool radio stations across the country in, in the major cities, but none of them do it exactly like we do. Pretty much 24-7, the same style of music. Um, so it's a hybrid. It's a crossover. 
Um, and I'm hugely proud of what we've been able to achieve. We're going to celebrate our 10th birthday next January. And we've got a lot of special events planned. So uh, keep your calendars open between uh, the 17th, I think, and the 25th. So yeah, that's a big crossover. And I just want to finish by um, giving a shout out to one of my heroes. Because I couldn't do what I do every day. Firstly, without my wife, she's my hero. I have to give her a shout out. Maren Klopman, um, I'm part of her life and she's a very important part of mine and I'm really proud to say that she's a successful ceramic artist, has pieces here at the Wiseman and uh, being a part of her life um, fuels what I get to do um, in my life too. So having a partnership um, is huge and I don't want to put too much emphasis on this but my mother would. Maren is German. And when I uh, grew up, the English and the Germans didn't always see eye to eye. They've had a difficult history this past century. So again, for me, um, that was pretty radical, to cross over to a new country and to marry someone from Germany 13 years ago. But, uh, now, thinking about it, I hadn't planned to, but that's a pretty huge crossover for me, too, in terms of where I've come from and where I am. But we both, and she was a huge inspiration, um, find strength in yoga and meditation. Meditation has become a key part of my uh, spiritual preparation for doing what I do every day on the air. And she, last year, brought me a book by a guy called Stephen Cope, um, who's really become special to me as a mentor. I've read all three of his books now, and next week I get to go on a week-long yoga retreat with him and Sharon Salzberg, another well-known meditator from the Buddhist tradition, meditation teacher, and uh, I get to spend a week in Massachusetts in silence. How crazy is that for me? I, last year, I went last year and I didn't speak for six days. That was crazy. So um, why I want to mention Stephen Cope is because I realized he's an awesome example of crossing over because 25 years ago he was a really successful psychiatrist in Boston and you know making a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. wanted to have a week to himself. So he went to this retreat center, Kripalu, and basically that changed his life. And ever since he's been involved with Kripalu, and sometimes I think I have a dream job, but get this, his title is founder and director of the Center for Exceptional Living. <laughs> That's a pretty good job to have. And why I think he's a great example of crossover is because as a psychiatrist, he came from the Western tradition of trying to figure it out with our mind. That's what that is all about. And then when he discovered yoga, he just uh, discovered the Eastern tradition of coming at it from within our bodies. That's what yoga does. It helps you unify your body, mind, and spirit to prepare you for what the day has to come. And actually, the Kripalu tradition is you use yoga to prepare yourself to go into meditation. And if you've had problems, I tried to meditate for years, and I was like, this is not working. I'm still having thoughts. <laughs> Try doing it for, for th this was the key for me. I went to Kripalu, and every, at the end of every yoga uh, class, they let you meditate if you want for 10 minutes. And that was the key, because your body is ready for it then. So the crossover between psychiatry and yoga, that's, that's where it clicked for me. Maren was trying to get me to do yoga for 10 years, and I would go for a while, and, and it never clicked. But having Stephen explain it from a psychiatrist's point of view really, really worked for me. And that crossover between the Eastern and the Western traditions, I think, is actually might be a key for us now as we look towards our future, because 
Western democracy and capitalism does not have all the answers to how we're going to develop in the future. I'm sorry, we, they promised us that they would, but I don't think, seriously, they promised me when I was growing up, you're gonna have a three day week, all the computers are gonna be doing all the work for you, <laughs> it's gonna be great. Didn't quite work out that way, did it? So looking at the future and, and, and trying to put into context for this talk, uh, what's a good crossover to focus on? I think that crossover of the, the Eastern traditions and the Western coming together, you know, trying to cross over all the intellectual experiences that different civilizations have had on this planet and try and coalesce them into a way to survive, that's gonna be our biggest crossover. So I hope that suffices as my 20 minute crossover talk. Does it? Yeah? Round of applause?